Section 41. The Yak, the Bison, the Buffaloes, the Tamarau and Anoa, the Muskox. The Yak. The Yak is naturally an inhabitant of the very high plateau and mountains of Tibet, where the climate is cold and the air excessively dry. Lower down on the Indian side of the Himalaya, a smaller race is found domesticated, which is the only one able to stand the climate of India or of Europe, where it is now kept in some parks as a curiosity. The tamed yaks are usually much smaller than the wild. These sometimes reach a weight of between 1,100 and 1,200 pounds. In form, they are long and low, very massive, and with hair almost entirely black, this falls off along the sides into a long, sweeping fringe. The tail is thickly tasseled with fine hair and is employed by Indian princes for fly flaps. The wild yak has large, massive black horns curved upwards and forwards in the male. In Ladakh and Chinese Tibet, the yaks inhabit a desolate and barren country in which their main food is a dry, coarse grass on which they nevertheless contrive to keep themselves in condition, feeding in the mornings and evenings, and lying down by day to rest among the rocks. The Bison The bison form a marked group differing from others of the ox tribe. They possess 14 pairs of ribs, while the oxen have only 13, the yak has 14, and have very heavy, massive heads, broader and more convex foreheads than the oxen, longer spinal processes on the vertebrae on the front part of the back, and larger muscles to hold the ponderous head, causing a hump, which in the American bison is very marked. There are two living species of bison, one of which is found in Europe, the other in North America. The European bison. This is the most interesting survival of the primitive fauna of the Old World. It is still found wild, though protected, in a large forest in Lithuania, the property of the Tsar of Russia, called the Forest of Bielowitsa. A few are also left of the purely wild stock in the Caucasus. Those in Lithuania have been protected for several centuries, and the herd is numbered from time to time. In 1857, there were 1,898 of these bison left. In 1882, there were only 600. In 1889, the herd had sunk to 380, but in 1892 it had risen to 491. The presence of the bison in the Caucasus had been almost forgotten till Mr. Littledale and Prince Demidoff gave accounts of hunting it there quite recently. The Zuber, as it is called, only survives in some very inaccessible parts of the mountains, preserved by the Grand Duke Sergius Mikhailovich in the Kuban district. There it exists as a really wild animal. The dimensions of one recently shot were 10 feet from the muzzle to the end of the last vertebra of the tail. The Grand Duke has to obtain special permission from the Tsar to shoot one whenever he goes to the Caucasus. This bison seems to have been an inhabitant of most of the forests of Europe and northern Asia. Its remains show that it existed in Britain and it was plentiful in the Black Forest in the time of Caesar. It is the largest of all European quadrupeds, measuring as much as 10 feet 1 inch from the nose to the root of the tail and standing nearly 6 feet high at the shoulder. Prince Demidoff states his belief that it is found on the southern slopes of the Caucasus Range between the hills and the Black Sea. The weight of this bison reaches 1,700 pounds. It is now rare to see more than five or six together. Though the animal is so massive, its horns are rather small and slender and curve upwards. The mane, which like the rest of the coat is of a uniform rich brown, is thick and curly but not developed like that of the American bison. The American bison. The American bison is the western representative of the bison of Europe. The almost complete disappearance of this species is one of the warnings against reckless destruction of animal life. It was formerly found in millions on the prairies, and its meat formed the staple food of the Red Indians, who lived on the flesh and used the robes of those killed in winter for great coats and bedding. When Audubon went up the upper Missouri, bison were in sight almost throughout the voyage. They were even carried down on ice floes on the river. The bulls were very large and were occasionally savage, especially when attacked and wounded, but usually they were harmless animals. 
Every winter and spring, they made migrations along regular routes to fresh pastures. These lines of travel were then black with bison. The females had their calves by their sides and all traveled in herds, feeding as they went. At the present time, the only remains of the bison are the paths they left on the prairies and their bones and skulls. The paths are still distinctly seen, worn by the treks of the great beasts, which have now perished. The bones were collected in stacks and sold to make manure. Colonel Roosevelt, in an article contributed to the Encyclopedia of Sport, thus describes the destruction of the bison. Quote, Pursuit by sportsmen had nothing to do with the extermination of the bison. It was killed by the hide hunters, redskin, white, and half-breed. The railways, as they were built, hastened its destruction, for they gave means of transporting the heavy robes to market. But it would have been killed out anyhow, even were there no railroads in existence. Once the demand for the robes became known to the Indians, they were certain to exterminate it. Originally, the bison ranged from the Rocky Mountains to the Alleghenies and from Mexico to the Peace River, but its center of abundance was the vast extent of grassland stretching from the Saskatchewan to the Rio Grande. All the earlier explorers who crossed these great plains from Lewis and Clark onwards spoke of the astonishing multitudes of the bison, which formed the sole food of the horse Indians. The herds were pressed steadily back but the slaughter did not begin till after the Civil War. Then the commercial value of the robes became fully recognized, and the transcontinental railways rendered the herds more accessible. The slaughter was almost incredible, for the bison were slain literally by millions every year. They were first exterminated in Canada and the Southern Plains. It was not till 1883 that the last herd was killed off from the great northwestern prairies." End quote. The height of a fine bull American bison at the shoulder is six feet. The horns are short, blunt, and curved, and sat farther back on the forehead than in the European species. The hindquarters are low and weak, and the mane develops in winter into a thick robe covering the neck, shoulders, and chest. An adult bull bison was found to weigh 1,727 pounds. The woodland bison of Athabasca, now nearly exterminated, are larger than the prairie bison and have finer coats. In 1897, there were said to be between 280 and 300 head remaining in two herds. The Buffaloes The buffaloes are so far distinct from other wild cattle that they will not interbreed with them. Yet one species, the Indian buffalo, has been domesticated for a long, though unknown, period, and is among the most valuable of tame beasts of draft, as well as for dairy purposes. The various buffaloes usually have little hair, especially when old, and have flatter shoulders than the gaur, gaiel, or bison. The pairs of ribs number 13. The African Buffalo Great differences in size and color exist in the African buffaloes. Whether they are separate species or not may be doubtful, but the small yellow Congo buffalo with upturned short horns is a vastly different creature from the large black Cape buffalo. There is also an Abyssinian or brown race of African buffalo and another in Senegambia smaller than the former and a reputed gray race near Lake Chad. The Cape buffalo is a heavy, thick-set animal, all black in color, with large, massive horns covering the skull and nearly meeting in the middle line of the forehead. In height, it varies from 4 feet 10 inches to 5 feet at the shoulder. This species ranges from South Africa to the Congo on the west and to the region of the equator on the east of the continent. Firearms, and lately rinderpest, have greatly reduced the number of these creatures. They live and feed in herds and, like the Indian species, are fond of the neighborhood of water in which they bathe, but are not so dependent on bathing and wallowing as the former. Fully as formidable as the Indian buffalo, and much like it in habits, the African species is quite distinct. It has different horns, broad at the base and curled and tapering at the ends. Among the extreme measurements of the Indian buffalo's horns recorded is one of 12 feet 2 inches from tip to tip along the curve. Those of the African buffalo are seldom more than 6 feet, measured in the same way. 
By far the greatest number of hunting accidents in Africa were caused by the buffalo. Sir Samuel Baker shot a buffalo bull one evening near the White Nile. His men actually danced upon the body when the animal rose to its feet and sent them flying into the river like so many frogs. It then disappeared in the thick vegetation. On the following day, supposing that it must have died during the night, 30 or 40 men, armed with double-barreled guns, went to look for it. The result was thus recorded by Sir Samuel Baker. Quote, They had not been ashore for many minutes when I first heard a shot and then a regular volley. My people returned with the head of the buffalo and a large quantity of meat, but they also carried the body of my best man, who, when leading the way through the high reeds, following the traces of blood, actually stumbled upon the buffalo lying in the swamp, and the light guns failed to stop its charge. The crooked horn had caught him behind the ear, and, penetrating completely through the neck, had torn out the throat as though it had been cut. The savage beast had then knelt upon the body and stamped it into the muddy ground until it fell beneath the fire of thirty men." End quote. The head and body of a male cape buffalo are nine feet long. It is stated that the parasite conveyed by the tsetse fly remains in the blood of the buffalo, which is not affected by it, and that this forms a reserve whence the fly, after sucking the blood of the buffalo, poisons other animals. The Congo Buffalo This is a very small race, the height at the shoulder being about 3 feet 6 inches. The shape of the horns varies, but they are wrinkled at the bases and flattened, and turn upwards, ending in thin, sharp tips. The hair is bright reddish-yellow. It is entirely a West African species. Sir Samuel Baker records an instance in which his brother was nearly killed by a small West African buffalo, probably one of the species in question. It is said to be less gregarious than the Cape Buffalo, and usually found in pairs. The Indian or Water Buffalo Very great interest attaches to this animal, if only from the fact that it is evidently a species domesticated directly from the wild stock. It therefore deserves consideration, both as a wild and as a domesticated animal. It is found wild in the swampy jungles at the foot of the Himalaya, in the Ganges Delta, and in the jungles of the central provinces. Also, it is believed in the jungles of West Assam. Like the African species, it is an animal of great size and strength, with short brown hair, white fetlocks, and immense, long, narrow, flattened horns. It is almost aquatic by preference, passing many hours of each day wallowing in the water or standing in any deep pool with only the tips of its nostrils and its horns out of the water. By general consent, it is the most dangerous of Indian animals after the tiger. A buffalo bull, when wounded, will hunt for its enemy by scent as persistently as a dog hunting for a rabbit. A writer in Country Life lately gave an account of a duel between himself, armed with a small and light rifle, and a buffalo bull, in which the latter hunted him for more than an hour, each time being driven off by a shot from the light rifle, and each time returning to the search until it was killed. Sir Samuel Baker, when he first went to Ceylon, found the buffaloes practically in possession of the meadows round a lake in the neighborhood of his quarters, and waged a war of extermination against the bulls, which were very dangerous. The buffaloes of Ceylon are the same as those of India, but the horns are inferior in size. The charge of a buffalo is a serious matter, says Sir Samuel Baker. Quote, Many animals charge when infuriated, but they can generally be turned aside by the stunning blow of a rifle shot, even if they be not mortally wounded. But a buffalo is a devil incarnate when it has once decided on the offensive. Nothing will turn it. It must be actually stopped by death, sudden and instantaneous, as nothing else will stop it. If not killed, it will assuredly destroy its adversary. There is no creature in existence so determined to stamp the life out of its opponents, and the intensity of its fury is unsurpassed when a wounded bull rushes forward upon its last desperate charge. Should it succeed in overthrowing its antagonist, it will not only gore the body with its horns, but will kneel upon the lifeless form and stamp it with its hooves until the mutilated remains are beyond recognition." End quote. The true Indian buffalo is usually shot from the back of an elephant, 
Hunting it on foot is dangerous in the extreme, for the buffalo can crash through obstacles which would prevent any man from making his way through them when escaping. When domesticated, the Indian buffalo loses most traces of its savageness. It is habitually managed by the children, who take the herds out to graze in the jungle and drive them back, often riding on one of the bulls at night. They dislike Europeans and often show this by attacking them, but otherwise they are quite tame and are docile when in harness or carrying burdens. The buffalo's milk is very rich and it makes a much larger percentage of butter than ordinary cow's milk. So useful is this mud and water loving animal in all swampy districts that wherever rice is cultivated, it is almost indispensable. The result is that the Indian buffalo has been transported probably in comparatively modern times, to many distant quarters of the globe. When this was done is not known, but it is probable, for instance, that it was not known in Egypt in the days of the pharaohs, for its form never appears in the paintings and sculptures. Now it is seen very far up the Nile, and plays an important part in Egyptian agriculture. It is also the general beast of burden, and for the dairy in the Pontine marshes of Italy. In Spain, it was probably introduced by the Arabs and is used to cultivate the marshy plains near the mouths of the rivers of Andalusia. It is also in use in the marshes of Hungary, in the Crimea, and across Western Asia to Afghanistan. We have thus the curious fact that a wild animal once confined to the jungles of the Indian Peninsula is now domesticated on two other continents. It has not been introduced into America yet, though it would be useful in the Mississippi swamps, but the Chinese have taken it to the Far East and established it as their favorite beast of burden. The Tamarau and Anoa In the island of Mindoro in the Philippines, a small black buffalo with upright, slightly incurved horns is found in the dense forests. The height at the shoulder is about 3 feet 6 inches. A few irregular marks of white are found on the forelegs, face, and occasionally the throat. It is called the tamarau by the natives, most of whom fear to attack it. Its habits are said to be much the same as those of the other buffaloes, but it is reputed to fight with the Indian buffaloes, which have escaped and become semi-wild in the forests. In Celebes, a still smaller wild forest buffalo is found, called the Anoa, it is only 3 feet 3 inches high at the shoulder and has upright, almost straight horns. The general color is brownish, tinged with yellow, that of the adults being very dark brown or black. Scarcely anything is known of its habits. The Muskox The Muskox was formerly found in immense numbers on the barren lands and other regions bordering on the Arctic ice. The hair of this animal reaches almost to the ground, and the horns are large and massive. At present, it is only common in the corner of North America, north and east of a line drawn from Fort Churchill on Hudson Bay to the mouth of the Mackenzie, and on the adjacent islands of the Arctic Sea. In former Arctic expeditions, the flesh of the musk oxen was a great and reliable source of food. Now some parts of the herds seem to have retired inland and in the winter to become mainly forest dwellers, but large numbers seem to endure the coldest parts of the Arctic winter in the open country of the far north, in the snows of Grinnell Land and of northern Greenland. The remains of musk oxen have been found in the river gravels of the Thames Valley with those of the reindeer and other northern species. The musk ox gallops at a great rate of speed when disturbed in the open, and makes as little of a steep mountainside as does the wild sheep. When fat, the flesh is very tolerable food, but if the animals grow thin, the taste of musk is very unpleasant. The color of the coat is dark brown. It is now in great demand for sledge rugs in Canada. This remarkable animal appears to be a form standing apart both from the oxen and the sheep. It will be seen from the above accounts of the whole wild bovine race that they all exhibit in a high degree many of the traits which are seen in domesticated animals of the same tribe. The chief differences made by man's selection and breeding affect the form of the body and the development of the udder, otherwise there is no great modification except the production of the drooping ear in some of the Indian species of domesticated oxen. 
No wild cattle have the level, flat back and rectangular body which mark all the best shorthorns and other breeds intended for beef. In the Asiatic and Gala humped breeds, the races which first domesticated the original wild species seem to have used the long processes of the vertebrae which cause the back of many wild cattle to form a hump as the basis of a valuable feature, the hump becoming, as it were, another joint of meat. The development of the udder has for untold centuries been the object of the breeders of cows. Consequently, we find that in the domesticated races this has become abnormally large. There is at present a very general tendency to get rid of the horns among all breeds of high quality, as these appendages cause much loss by wounds inflicted by cattle upon each other. But even in this respect, sentiment rather tends to preserve the horns as an ornament in some of the best milking breeds, such as the Jerseys. End of section 41